Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. And um, our first guest up on the show today is our good friend Andy Worthington. He's the author of the book, The Guantanamo Files, and also uh, directed the movie, the uh, documentary film, Outside the Law. He keeps a website at andyworthington.co.uk, and he is, well, and there's some competition here, but he is... uh, I think, uh, pretty much beyond dispute, the world's foremost expert and chronicler of the perpetual American war crime down at the, uh, well, collection of war crimes down there at the American prison at Guantanamo Bay in communist Cuba. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Andy? Yeah, I'm good, Scott. How are you? Good, good. And you sound great, too. Yeah, Uh, good. Yeah, the Skype thing is, uh, is working, I think. Yeah, I always had the worst problems with it, so I became a very, you know, very Luddite about it and just decided to stick with the phone, but I uh, finally got somebody to help me figure out how to get it working right, and so now I'm using it as much as I can because it sounds pretty damn good. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think my problem was I started trying to use it when it first came out 10 years ago or something, and it wasn't ready for prime time yet, and then I just, I didn't go back to try to make it work. Yeah. Anyway. Let's talk about Guantanamo Bay. A stupid president uh, gave a talk today at West Point, and uh, it's so funny. He says, I believe in American exceptionalism with every fiber of our being. But then he says, what makes us exceptional is our willingness to affirm international law. I don't even know what in the hell. I don't think he even has any idea what in the hell he's talking about. But then, speaking of uh, non sequiturs, here comes the next one. Quote, That's why I will continue to push to close Gitmo, because American values and legal traditions don't permit the indefinite detention of people beyond our borders. So my question for you, Andy, is how long has this guy been in office now as commander in chief of every branch of the U.S. military? Well, you know, far too long, really, to uh, to be demonstrating this kind of inability to understand that. uh, he has the power to do things, and um, you know, and he's still choosing not to do them. It's very strange that comment, isn't it? About um, about American values and legal traditions don't permit the indefinite detention of people beyond our borders. Does that mean that he's suggesting that within the borders, um, American values and legal traditions do permit the indefinite detention? Of people? <laughs> right. It's. <laughs> I don't think. Well, that's he's, what he's the one who signed the NDAA <laughs> Act into law on New Year's <laughs> Eve when everybody was out getting drunk, right? Yeah, maybe that's just just uh, reminding people of the NDAA. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's what exceptionalism means. No charges for you. Well, you know, I mean, I have to say, Scott, that he's done, you know, he's done the same thing. And actually, you know, we're going to talk about it soon. But it's, you know, it, it's almost a year, just over a year since he made a promise to resume releasing prisoners from Guantanamo. Um, you know, every time he speaks about it, he sounds great. But his actions never match um, his words. Mm-hmm. Um, and so here, here again, really is what he's, um, you know, he's he's saying, uh, you know, very briefly uh, some of the things that are that are wrong with Guantanamo. Even if he seems to be um, slightly confused this time around about exactly what he means, but you know, he's saying, you know, I will continue to push to close Guantanamo as though he's some kind of opposition politician pressurizing the Uni- the president of the United States to do something. Um, and you know, he is the president of the United States, and. Uh, there are certainly uh, lawmakers who who would have a go at him if he uh, really pushed for the closure of Guantanamo and did the things that he's able to do, but he's choosing not to. Uh, you know, up until recently, there'd been um, there'd been uh, more or less three years of of opposition from uh, Congress to try and make it very difficult for him to release prisoners from Guantanamo, and obviously, you know, politically, when he's up against Congress um, being in such a bullish mood, he was he was going to have to be up for a fight, 
Um, but he presented it to the public that Congress had totally tied his hands. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he always had a waiver in the legislation, which, you know, Senator Carl Levin, the, the head of the powerful Senate Armed Services Committee, um, had insisted on, on having in the legislation that allowed him to overcome these congressional obstacles and, mm. and bypass Congress if he regarded the release of prisoners as being in the national security interest of the United States. And as we see, every time he talks about Guantanamo, uh, closing the place is in the national security interest of the United States. So, you know, we've got this kind of disconnect. And right. So wait here a we now, are. Let me, sure, let me make sure yes, I understand sorry. you right here, Andy, because so it's not that Congress has said uh, well, I guess I'm confused, maybe. Um, it seems like two different issues here. Whether he can close the base and move all the prisoners out of there, or whether he right. can let this one, this one, or this one go at any given time. But you're telling me it's just one thing that Congress has done, and it applies to both cases, and the president has every authority under that law to issue a waiver. So if he wanted to send some Yemenis back to Yemen or some Uyghurs back to wherever, whoever's going to let them in, I guess they already took care of that, uh, he can do that. He can not just waive the restrictions on individual prisoners, but on the whole island prison. Is that correct? Well, no, it's not, actually. I'm sorry if I was unclear there, Scott. He can't actually... Um, well, it's much more difficult for him to actually close the, the, the prison. He doesn't have legislation that allows him to do that. There is no waiver uh, in the NDAA that allows him to do that. But he, as the President of the United States, he could. Um, he could do something exceptional. He could issue an executive order and move all the men from Guantanamo to the U.S. mainland, um, you know. Well, his original plan was to bring Gitmo justice to American shores as well and to go ahead and say, yeah, no, we still mean to hold these men without trial if we think they're guilty, but we know we can't prove it. We don't care. Uh, we'll hold them well, without charges or trial forever, but we should just do it in Illinois well, instead of in communist Cuba. Scott. I mean, I don't actually believe that. I mean, I actually think that if you move the men from Guantanamo to the United States mainland, you would suddenly find that there are a lot more reasons why, uh, why a courts would be saying, um, sorry, we don't actually have a tradition of holding people indefinitely without charge or trial on the United States mainland. Well, that was the original scam of putting it in Cuba in the first place, was that the, well, exactly. the U.S. law can't reach us here, and the first time the Supreme Court heard a case like that, they said, no, you're wrong. Exactly. But, you know, the Congress has has, you know, continues to block him from closing the facility at Guantanamo by bringing men to the United States mainland for whatever reason mm -hmm. to be be to continue to be held indefinitely to be put on trial, whatever. Although, um, couldn't he just completely ignore that? I mean, here's he's Mr. Signing Statement, no less than George W. Bush. Well, he can I'm start saying. a war in Libya. Can't he just order the military men at Guantanamo, close the prison, bring the men here? Don't worry, Congress will figure out what to tell you to do with the prisoners by the time you arrive in Miami. But I'm telling you, move, soldier, that's move. What, he's the commander-in-chief. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying, Scott. And, you know, and I think that you know, the pressure is going to be on him from, from those of us who care about this, you know, more and more as, the, as his presidency wanes. But the, the main issue at the moment is that half the men in Guantanamo are men that, that his administration, you know, that, that a, a task force and review boards set up by him, high-level people, have said, you know, half the guys at Guantanamo, 77 of the remaining 154 men are people that we do not want to carry on holding indefinitely. We don't want to put them on trial. Um, and it's those people who he has the ability to do something about. Every moment that we talk about it, he has the ability to do something about it, regardless of whether or not Congress is particularly supportive. And it must be said that um, Congress was persuaded through, you know, through the entreaties of high-level people like Senator Carl Levin at the end of last year to ease their restrictions on the release of prisoners. It has never, there has never been a better time in the last three years for President Obama to release men from Guantanamo than, than this, this moment in time. Um, but since he promised to resume releasing prisoners one year ago, um, one year and five days ago, when he, um, you know, when, when uh, he was responding to the outrage uh, that had been felt internationally about the prison-wide hunger strike and the men's despair, and he promised to resume releasing prisoners, he appointed two envoys to help, and we have had 12 men released in the last year. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm very glad to see those 12 men uh, released. But 77 of the, the remaining men are still waiting to be freed. And the majority of those men were told in January 2010 that the task force that President Obama had set up, high-level task force, had looked at their cases, that the U.S. wasn't interested in holding them forever or 
uh, or putting them on trial. And All right, yet, I'm sorry. We've got to hold it right there, Andy, and go out and take this break. Can you hear the music? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right back after this, everybody, with the great Andy Worthington. AndyWorthington.co.uk. And buy his book. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Man, I had a chance to have an essay published in the book Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman, but I didn't understand what an opportunity it was. Boy, do I regret I didn't take it. This compendium of thoughts by the greatest anti-war writers and activists of our generation will be remembered and studied long into the future. You've got to get Why Peace. You've got to read Why Peace. It features articles by Harry Brown, Robert Naiman, Fred Bronfman, Dahlia Wasfi, Richard Cummings, Karen Gutowski, Butler Schaefer, Kathy Kelly, Robert Higgs, Anthony Gregory, and so many more. Why peace? Because war is the health of everything wrong with our society. Get Why Peace down at the bookshop or Amazon.com. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show here. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with the heroic Andy Worthington. AndyWorthington.co.uk. The book is Guantanamo Files. The movie is Outside the Law. You can find his writings also at the Future of Freedom Foundation, FFF.org. And um, so uh, let's see, before the break there, we were talking about how many of these men have already been cleared for release um, and are still being held anyway. And now, so you said it was about half, Andy. Um, yeah. 77 out of 154 or something like that already cleared. Now, what about the rest? Because as far as, well, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, completely familiar with each and every one of these guys, but it makes sense to me that when they finally closed at least some of the CIA black sites and they brought, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin Al-Sheib and a couple of other of these extremely guilty 9-11 conspirators to Guantanamo that, um... You know, it made sense that they would be held, what, somewhere that they were actually, you know, deserved to be held under some circumstances or another. But that, if, if, if anything, it really just went to show how innocent everybody else there was. But so now when you're telling me it's about half and half, I wonder about that because it seemed like, you know, the really guilty, the, the real friends of bin Laden that they grabbed were only, what, a dozen, maybe two? Yeah, well, uh, you know, and possibly less than that. I mean, the, the thing is, Scott, of the other 77 men, the majority of those men have been put forward for what are called periodic review boards. So these are men who, when the task force that President Obama established, uh, when he took office for the first time in 2009, when they looked at the cases of all the prisoners, they designated them for prosecution, for release or for ongoing imprisonment without charge or trial. That last one was the really, really dodgy one where they said, you know, these guys, uh, we think they're too dangerous to release, but we haven't got, um, we haven't got the evidence to actually put them on trial. Um, so that means there are fundamental problems with the evidence. But anyway, what happened was that um, President Obama issued an executive order approving the, um, the ongoing imprisonment of these men. It was 48 of them. Two of them subsequently died. So 46 men. He personally said, um, I'm going to go with what the task force told me. These guys are too dangerous to release, um, but we haven't got the evidence to put them on trial. So I'm going to sign this executive order and we're going to hold them. What we're going to do is we're going to give them periodic reviews to see whether we see we, we think that they're still uh, too dangerous to release um, on, an, on a, you know, an ongoing basis. Those took nearly three years to establish. And last year, they finally began to take place in the fall. There's only been a handful of them so far. But almost all of the other men that are still held are supposed to get these periodic reviews. Not just the ones designated for indefinite detention by the task force, but the majority of those who were designated for prosecution by the task force. Because guess what? The prosecutions at Guantanamo in the military commission system uh, the appeals court recently told the government that they're invented war crimes um, and that they're, um, that, that they're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they actually dismissed two of the only convictions that they ever achieved. Believe, can you believe this? You know, Congress invented war crimes that they inserted into the Military Commissions Act. And the and the courts eventually had to turn around and say, Your oh, hell yeah. Aren't worth what anything. I can't believe is that the courts ever made them stop. I mean, we we talked for years about how ridiculous it was that these war criminals who, you know, for example, are torturing children are then charging the children that they tortured and are and held for years without charges of war crimes. Uh, you know, come on, pot kettle black. I mean, it's not even that right. It's like, uh, uh, you know, Cotter, he was. The the worst thing he was uh, guilty of is the non-crime of self-defense against foreign invaders. 
Um, well, and, and, you know, the rest of this material support this and that. I'm amazed that a judge said, no, you can't do that. Actually, the law is a thing written on a piece of paper, not your will being exercised however you feel like. Who ever heard of that well, exactly. in the 21st century? And so, you know, so what we've got is that, you know, we've got these review boards that have started recently and they've, um, they've actually approved two men, two Yemenis for release. So they're added to the list of all the cleared prisoners waiting to go. Um, but if you look at how many people are facing these reviews and how many people are cleared for release, then who are the people who are not, um, you know, who are not included? Who are the people who are so genuinely bad, allegedly, um, that there is no system in place that's going to lead to their release and that they're going to be put on trial? Um, it actually is the six men who are currently uh, charged. And it's, um, and it's two other guys who have um, taken plea deals. Um, and it's one other guy who's serving... Um, a sentence that he was given under the Bush administration, even though his is one of the uh, convictions that was overturned by the by the appeals court. Mm. Um, that's it. That's actually nine of the people left in Guantanamo. Nine of the 154 guys are people who categorically the U.S. government has said, um, you know, there's no there's n there's no way that these people are going to go through any kind of review process and be told that they will be released. Um, <laughs> What, can, what more can I say, Scott? Uh, is this what we're left with? I mean, the periodic reviews have have already judged the cases of three men, um, and as I said, two of them were cleared for release. In the in the third case, uh, the review board, which is you know high ranking people in various government departments and the intelligence agencies, decided that the man should still be held. Um, it's pretty disgraceful, really. There isn't. Um, actual evidence against him demonstrating uh, that he remains a threat to the United States. But you know, as I know, that you know that, that common sense and a sense of proportion have never been uh, been things that that have taken place at Guantanamo. Um, so they're going to go through these periodic reviews, and they're going to, you know, maybe two out of, one out of every three, they're going to say no, we have to keep holding these guys. But the number of people that they claiming the ability to hold for any reason because they're actually a significant threat of any kind um, is, a, is a dwindling figure. And I really wish that we could somehow get this message out to the American people. Um, mm. But I honestly think that you know, most people still aren't aware of quite what a disgraceful failure of intelligence, um, an abject uh, exercise of cruelty Guantanamo has been for the last 12 years. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm confused, too, because who cares if they don't have any evidence? They can convict anyone they want of anything they want in federal court. Yeah. Accuse them of mail fraud or something. Put them away for life without parole. I don't think that the federal prosecutors have ever lost a case in federal court. Federal jury will put anyone in prison for as long as they're told to with you know, point zero 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 point one percent exceptions, and never in the case of a terrorism case is a jury going to nullify and say hell no and set someone free. They never have, certainly not in the 21st century they haven't. They could convict well, any of yeah. these guys of anything just by pointing at them and saying to the jury, first of all, just look at them. You can tell well, that he believes in this Allah crap. Come on, give him life. Up to a point, Scott, but I think the problem is that, you know, what they've actually got in Guantanamo for the most part, you know, uh, beyond the innocent people who were absolutely nothing to do with anything, and, you know, many of those have been released, but there are still some there. But what they've largely got in Guantanamo now are people who were demonstrably involved with the Taliban to some extent, either as foot soldiers or in some notorious cases as chefs, um, but, you know, these were people who, who were captured in a military context. So what we should be talking about is like, you know, are we really going to hold people forever in this military context? Or does the point come where we should let them go? These are not people that if you put them in federal court, you've actually got any kind of crime. It's like, what, the most you've ever got against this guy is that he went to a training camp. Um, basically, they're POWs. They're not even accused criminals. They're POWs, but because they were irregulars... Uh, you know, supposedly under the Doug Fight theory, Geneva doesn't apply, POW rules don't apply, so they just hold them in this, you know, legal black hole. Well, that's what I think. I think they are essentially misplaced prisoners of war, and that was a deliberate, um, deliberate mistake on the part of the Bush administration. And, you know, and that's what upsets me when you read the kind of uh, knee-jerk responses to any discussion of, uh, about Guantanamo from people on the right who, who, you know, just call them terrorists. You know, they, they, they were sold that message by Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and, and George W. Bush. But they have swallowed it, and nobody has sufficiently challenged them in all these years to say, most of these guys never had anything to do with terrorism. Right. 
Well, and uh, let me go ahead and ask you now, is there any way I could keep you past the top of the hour and do one more segment in the next uh, in the next hour? Yeah, how long? Yeah, sure. How okay, long good, because be? I got more questions, and okay. uh, we're almost yeah, out of time yeah. for this segment. Um, but I wanted to bring up here real quick, since we're talking about the, you know, the prosecutions and, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and all them have come up, that... And this is a point that the other Scott Horton, the international human rights lawyer, has made on this show for, uh, you know, nine years now or something like that, is that we already have laws and we have 200 and something years worth of experience of putting people in prison for whatever we be in the U.S. government in this case. And what what Addington and Bush and then later Congress after the Supreme Court said you had to include Congress, what they did with this ad hoc thing is uh, they created a mess. And they don't know right. how to control it, and they're making it up as they go along, and that's why it never works. And that's why Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is now allowed to show up in court in a camouflage hunting jacket, as though he is some kind of general in Al-Qaeda's army, rather than Just the lowest scum of the earth two-bit criminal, uh, yeah. which would never be allowed in federal court. But uh, that's because of uh, how illegal the whole process is. Now, I'm sorry, we're out of time, but I'll let you comment on that if you want, and we'll be back at 6 after. It's Andy Worthington, everybody. The book is... The Guantanamo Files. Hey, all Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make the show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first. And just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. All right, you guys, welcome back to the dang thing here, man. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. Hey, let's do business. You own a business? Or a political group or something? Advertise on the show. I'm Scott at ScottHorton.org. Let's work something out. I'm in a capitalistic mood right now, yeah. All right. I'm on the line with the great Andy Worthington, the heroic Andy Worthington. He's at uh, the Future Freedom Foundation, FFF.org, also at andyworthington.co.uk. The book is The Guantanamo Files, uh, really biographies or, you know, as much as uh, could be known at the time anyway, about each and every one of the detainees there at Guantanamo Bay, and then plus the documentary film Outside the Law. So uh, thank you again uh, very much for joining us and for holding through that long top of the hour break there, Andy. Um, since I still had a couple of questions for you here. Oh, I guess, uh, but before we went out to break, I was on my little rant there about what a disaster the actual trials are and the, the, the process of the trials for those who actually are even getting them. And the, pardon me, because trials should go in ironic quotes there. I, I meant to say it in an italicized sort of tone of voice there. Um, the, the ones of them who are getting trials... Uh, their trials are seem to be a total joke to me because it's all made up ad hoc crap. What do you think? Well, I think the main problem is that these men were tortured, and um, and torture is inadmissible in uh, U.S. courts. Um, so the problem is that the the prosecution is constantly trying to suppress um, all mention of the fact that these men were held for years uh, in uh, in black sites run by the CIA uh, and subjected to torture. And in fact, you can't have anything resembling. Um, a fair trial without um, raising these issues in the first place. My feeling, Scott, has always been that if these cases were transferred to federal court, um, then so long as they could come up with something that resembled evidence, an average American jury would overlook all of these issues um, and would convict them if if anything resembling evidence was provided. Well, um, and look, I mean, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramsey bin al Sheikh both bragged to Al Jazeera that they're guilty before they were ever captured. So yeah, well, uh, there's well, no and, question about who Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is here, regardless of what he said under torture. I know he took responsibility for every criminal act since Hitler's suicide under yeah. torture. No, I think so. But, you know, but I'm, I'm wondering whether we're ever going to get to this point, Scott, where, you know, where we where these trials are going to go ahead. You know, I mean, that's what I think. I think that the, you know, the Obama administration said they were going to try these men in federal court in New York City. Um, and then back down when they got criticized, which made Eric Holder look really stupid. Um, but I think also, you know, was was uh, the disemboweling of what remained of the law um, in the in the Guantanamo years um, that they didn't go ahead with the only way that they could have done it. Um, these pretrial hearings are going to drag on and on and on and on endlessly at Guantanamo, I think. 
Um, and in fact, and essentially what's happening is that these men are being held indefinitely and may continue to be held indefinitely for the rest of their lives without the trial ever actually taking place. So I would think at some point it would make sense to uh, move them back to New York as they, as they wanted to do, have these trials in the best way possible, and when mention of torture comes up, to use that as, the, as, as an excuse for saying, as a reason for saying, as an opportunity for saying, we know how tainted these cases are, but we have evidence um, that, we, that has come from other sources to demonstrate that what we're saying is true in the case of these people. And we promise in front of the world that we will never, ever go back to the dark side, as Dick Cheney insisted we had to do after the 9-11 attacks. We will not torture. That's what I'd like to see happen, Scott. But, well, you know, you know, I think it's a miles pretty, away from that. It's a pretty <laughs> common principle, but is there anything in Anglo-American law that actually says if you were tortured, then you've done your time and you're free to go now? I mean, it would be horrible to see Khalid Sheikh Mohammed released, but then again, they shouldn't have tortured him. Well, no, and I don't know of anything that, you know, to suggest that, but I don't that think... That just that seems the, like fair, you know, kind of practice, right? If they tortured you, then you're free to go, man. You've done your Well, time. you know, I think that if the things that he is supposed to have done, he did do, then I can't see anyone actually suggesting that he should, that he should go free. Except me. No, I think the default position, the one that the Bush administration established after 9-11 is, hey, let's tear up all the rule books and then imprison a load of people. Um, and, and, you know, and they didn't care whether, whether any of these people were ever going to be released. We have the problem at Guantanamo. That the place is stuffed full of nobodies who can't get released. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's the prison without end. So the Bush administration has set up a, the, the kind of perfect system for holding people without rights for the rest of their lives. And the default position for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the rest of those guys is that whether the trials go ahead or not, uh, they are staying there forever and will not be released. Uh, you know, the, the question is whether, uh, after the fact, the Amer some American government or other can come up with a, with, you know, with, with a structure that will enable them to go through a process to justify it. I don't know whether that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, so can you tell me this? How many people are on hunger strike right now? I know they quit covering it. They quit covering it, and what we have is the terrible stories that are coming out from the prisoners themselves, including you know this this Syrian man Abu Wail Diab, who's been cleared for release. Uh, like many of the hunger strikers, why is he hunger striking? Because he was told four years ago that the U.S. didn't want to hold him anymore, and that he'd be going home soon, or if not home to Syria, then the U.S. would find another country for him. But he's still stuck there, and he's been on a hunger strike. He recently won a court case where he persuaded a a federal court judge. Uh, to um, put a stay on his force feeding. Um, that didn't last. That, that stay has been dropped. But she did insist that the United States government provided uh, videotaped evidence of him being force fed and of him being violently moved to be force fed when he didn't want to leave his cell. Uh, this, is, this is certainly something of a breakthrough. Um, and I hope that it's putting pressure on the administration because, you know, here is a man who's being force fed who, um, you know, he's actually been offered a new home by President Mujica of Uruguay. Mm. Uh, he is offered to take six men who can't be safely repatriated. Um, and, and, and Mr. Diab is one of them. So as far as I can see, President Obama could put this man and five others on a plane and send them to Uruguay tomorrow. And I don't know why he doesn't do that. And by the uh, way, for people not familiar, it isn't like Uruguay is some rogue state out there. They're perfectly compliant and would do everything up to American specifications for keeping an eye on these guys or whatever, whatever. Well, I mean, actually, he said, no, we're not going to um, we're not going to subject them to uh, to any kind of, you know, obsessive scrutiny because uh, we want them to have a new life, which I think is the fair thing to say, because the problem with Guantanamo. Well, and that's is why that Obama's not releasing them then. Well, you know, yeah, he doesn't want to have to go through that problem of having to tell Congress, look, these guys are not a threat to anybody. That's why we decided that we're prepared to release them. Um, so I don't know. But, you know, he's one of this guy, Mr. Diab. Is one of the hunger strikers. He's certainly not the only one who hasn't been cleared for release, who's being fo who, who has been cleared for release but is still held, who is being force-fed. Um, the numbers, as you say, Scott, are difficult to know exactly because the uh, military stopped reporting them in December um, because it was attracting too much attention for the prisoners. But right. from what I understand, it's probably up to, up to a couple of dozen of the men are on a hunger strike and being force-fed. All right, and now I read a thing, uh, last question here. Um, I read a thing 
uh, last week, I guess, that said that they had this new trick going on in the Congress. You know how they do where they, nobody wants to vote for a pay raise, and no congressman does. So what they do is they make the pay raise automatic unless they vote against it, right? Right. And so they yeah. never do. Well, they passed a thing that would basically make closing Guantanamo automatic unless they pass a new thing stopping it. And that was supposedly, you know, maybe a way that Obama had figured out to get Congress to go along with this thing and give them a safe out so that these Republicans can tell their idiot Republican constituents back home that I tried to stop them without really trying to stop them. What yeah. do you think of that? Is that true? Well, I mean, certainly, well, you know, again, this is Senator Carl Levin. I think, you know, I think I have the utmost respect for the way that Senator Carl Levin uh, genuinely has has accepted that Guantanamo is a stain on any claim that America might try to make to be a country that respects the rule of law. Um, and, you know, he's certainly been pushing more than the administration has, as far as I can see, um, to try and, and bring an end to it. Now, what needs to happen is that um, is that parts of Congress need to be persuaded that their absolute ban on bringing prisoners to the U.S. mainland for any reason um, is dropped. And last year, part of the deal that was made in Congress was that uh, Republican lawmakers, for the most part, would ease their restrictions on the release of prisoners, but in exchange, they, they insisted that the absolute ban on bringing prisoners to the U.S. mainland for any reason was maintained in the legislation. I can't see that they're going to want to give up on that and that they will find their way around um, this nice little trick and will, you know, yet again put this into the NDAA right. um, to try and make sure that Guantanamo stays open. Um, but we'll see, Scott. You know, I mean, what we're really, again, waiting for is a, a much more of a demonstration of leadership from the one man who is supposed to have um, have the ability to deal with these things, which is the president of the United States. Right. Well, anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time. As always, it's great to talk to you, especially for staying over with us here. Yeah, well, that's been great to talk for all this time, Scott. Thank you very much. Always I sure appreciate having you. you. Uh, that's the great Andy Worthington, everybody. He's at andyworthington.co.uk at the Future Freedom Foundation. That's fff.org. And uh, get his book, The Guantanamo Files, and his movie, Outside the Law. And we'll be right back. The military industrial complex. The disastrous rise of misplaced power. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here. I'd like for you to read this book, The War State, by Michael Swanson. America's always gone to war a lot, though in older times it would disarm for a bit between each one. But in World War II, the U.S. built a military and intelligence apparatus so large, it ended up reducing the former constitutional government to an almost ceremonial role and converting our economy into an engine of destruction. In the war state, Michael Swanson does a great job telling the sordid history of the rise of this national security state, relying on important first-hand source material, but writing for you and me. Find out how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all alternately empowered and fought to control this imperial beast, and how the USA has gotten to where it is today. Corrupt, bankrupt, soaked in blood, despised by the world. The War State by Michael Swanson. Available at Amazon.com and at Audible.com. Or just click the logo in the right-hand margin at ScottHorton.org. We should take nothing for granted. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com.